Volume good, Mike? Sounds good. Volume good for everyone? Okay. Everybody, would you stand with me before announcements and let's read the Word of God together? This will go into our uh, lesson later today. Let's read together from um, First Epistle of John, chapter one, verses five through seven. Won't you read along with me? Verse five. This is the message which we have heard from Him and declare to you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness. We lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. You may be seated. Well, just a couple things to let you know about if you're visiting, uh, passing through, or thinking of joining us again. A couple of events that will be upcoming. Uh, Midweek study is going to resume after Christmas and New Year's, so that will be starting back up again in January. Uh, Saturday, December 3rd, which is next Saturday, this, this coming Saturday at 10 a.m., uh, the women are having a Christmas breakfast at Homestead Manor in Thompson Station. Um, RSVP to Julie Pachochin, she's on her way back now, uh, by this coming Wednesday if you want to be part of that. Uh, if you haven't been there, it's, it's a really cool place. It's a kind of an antebellum Civil War style home, they have a restaurant, um, really cool place to visit. So any of the ladies who would like to be part of that, again, that's this coming Saturday, uh, December 3rd at 10 a.m. Down, down the line a little bit, but in April, uh, there's going to be an apologetics conference in Birmingham. This is April 21st through 22nd. Uh, if you'd like to be a part of the team that goes down to that conference, please contact Pastor Brian. Uh, a little bit later in May, um, the Christian Alliance for Orphans Conference is going to be held at Brentwood Baptist Church. That's May 4th and 5th. Um, if you'd like to be a part of that or attend that, please let us know. We have several uh, adoptive families in our church, as small as it is. There's, uh, there's a number of people who have brought orphans into their home. So if you'd like to be a part of that, I went last year and it was a real blessing. So again, that's coming up in May, so just keep your eyes open for that um, as it's forthcoming. All right, with that said, why don't you open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 12. I'm going to be teaching you this morning from John's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 20 through 36. Since there are a few visitors here, I will just go ahead and introduce myself as well. I'm Michael Wall, I'm an assistant pastor here, our senior pastor uh, Brian and his family are traveling. Uh, they're on their way back. Um, and so on those happy occasions when um, he's out of town, I get to sort of hold down the fort here and do the teaching. So if what you hear today terrifies you and you never want to come back, just know it's normally not this bad. Okay. So don't, don't throw it all away just based on this visit. But anyway, it's, it's great to be up here. Um, it's great to be speaking to you guys. I hope the hope the Lord blesses us this morning with what he would have for us. Okay, so John chapter 12, um, verses 20 through 36. This scripture, for all intents and purposes, ends Jesus' public ministry. And the events that lead up to it have been very dramatic. If you recall, earlier in chapter 12, he's entered Jerusalem triumphantly to shouts of Hosanna on what we now call Palm Sunday. Prior to that, he had been anointed in Bethany by the woman who washed his feet with the expensive perfume, and he miraculously raised Lazarus from the dead during that same time period. Since returning to Jerusalem, he has warned about the end times. Uh, he does that in Matthew chapter 24. He predicted the destruction of the temple, and he's told the parables of the fig tree, the talents, and the wicked servant. Chronologically in Scripture, after um, this set of verses that we see today, he, for the most part, withdraws, and he spends the rest of his time um, in close consultation with his disciples, his close followers, through the Last Supper, his trial, and his death. This scripture, I want to speak to you about three different topics um, that just kind of naturally flow out of what we're going to read today. Uh, the first topic is called 
seeking Jesus. The second one is called the coming of the hour. And finally, walking in the light. So with that said, uh, follow along with me. I'm going to go ahead and read uh, all of our verses, uh, 20 through 36, and we're going to go back through them and study and see what the Lord can bring to us today. All right, verse 20. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said that it had, and heard it said it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world, now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. The people answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this son of man? Then Jesus said to them, A little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word, where we ask again that it would find a place in our minds and in our hearts this morning. And we just thank you for its richness. I pray that we would grow in understanding and all that you would say to us, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So as we dive back into verse 20, it says, There were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. The Greek word for Greeks here is called Hellenists, which is different from Hellenists. The Greek word here means that these are not Greek-speaking Jews. They weren't born Jewish. They didn't live in uh, Greek-speaking areas and then come up speaking Greek. But they were Gentiles. They were culturally Greek. They were born that way, but they had come to worship the God of Israel, though they weren't circumcised. They were like the Ethiopian eunuch that Philip meets in the book of Acts or Cornelius, uh, the Roman Gentile that Peter first converted. Scripture says they had come to the temple to worship. This image will convey a very important meaning uh, as we go through this. So just keep that in mind. The Greeks have come to the temple to worship, to know the God of Israel. Verse, 20, verse 21, it says, They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. Uh, we learn more about Philip initially in John's Gospel in chapter 1. First, Jesus finds him. This is what it says in John chapter 1, verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Nice and simple. And he did. From that point on, Philip's emphasis in ministry was in bringing people to Jesus and telling people about Jesus. The very next thing it says in chapter 1, after uh, Philip followed him, was Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. And thereon Nathanael was a follower as well. So he brought Nathanael to Jesus. He said, Come and see. 
Uh, incidentally, Christ pays perhaps the highest compliment he could be bestowed on to Nathaniel when he meets him. When he says there's nothing false in him. Can you imagine the Lord examining your heart, looking at you and saying, there's nothing false there. Rejoice the day. Amen? Amen. So Philip brings people to Jesus. He tells people about Jesus. Again, as we mentioned in Acts chapter 8, Philip, under the direction of an angel of the Lord, later goes south and shares the gospel with the Ethiopian eunuch. So he's this great networker, evangelist, a people person. So he also, along with Andrew, uh, it's worth noticing as well that they have Greek names. Philip and Andrew are both Greek names. This may have been why the Greeks sought them out in the first place. Um, they may have already been appointed. There's, we really don't know that. But in any case, they came to Philip. Philip came to Andrew. And in verse 21, we hear what the Greeks say to them. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. The Greek word for see here is edo, which means to physically see, but it also means to see and perceive with all other senses. In other words, we want to see him, hear him, touch him, feel him, experience him in full. We want to see him with all of our senses. So Philip tells Andrew, and they go together to tell Jesus in verse 22. So Jesus answers them. We don't know at this point if they have brought the Greeks with them or if it's just the two disciples. We're not sure who hears uh, what Jesus says next. But he answers in verse 23 by saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. He says, The hour has come. Now this gets very interesting. Well, how we mentioned at the beginning that this is the end, so to speak, of his public ministry, of his public outreach. Scripture tells us also that he came first to the Jews, to the house of Israel. We see this reflected in multiple places in the gospel. I'll share a couple of examples, well known, uh, to make that point. First is from Mark's gospel, chapter 7, the story of the Syrophoenician woman. Listen to verses 24 through 30. From there he arose went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. He entered a house and wanted, to, and wanted no one to know about it, but he could not be hidden. A woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Jesus said to her, Let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She answered and said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For this saying, Go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. When she had come to her house, she found the demon out and her daughter lying on the bed. Also earlier in John's Gospel, in chapter 4, he tells a Samaritan woman by the well that Samaritans don't know who it is they worship and that salvation is of the Jews. So Christ came first to the lost sheep of Israel. But we know now, as he explains to the woman at the well, that the time is coming when all true believers will worship the Father, the Spirit, and truth. That brings us back to our verse in the approach of these Greeks. So again, follow this image. We have these men, Gentiles by birth, brought into Judaism by their belief, but not part of the covenant. And now they seek out Jesus with a desire to see him, to hear him, to be touched by him, to experience him in every way. Meanwhile, at the same time, the leaders of the Jewish nation, Pharisees and priests, the Sadducees, have rejected Jesus completely throughout his ministry and continue to seek to kill him. In fact, not long before this time, right before he entered Jerusalem, the night before, Luke's gospel tells us that he wept over the city. Luke 19, verses 41 through 44, record this. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you, meaning Jerusalem, had known, even you especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. 
Notice Jesus uses the same language here that he used in Matthew chapter 4 in saying, in describing how the great temple would be destroyed, that not one stone would be left on top of the other. Again, this is not a case of him not having any Jewish followers because most all of his followers at this time are, Jew, are Jewish. Nor is this in any way a rejection of Israel. So we believe that God's plans for Israel will come to fruition in the fullness of time after the rapture. But the nation, the leadership, uh, the political and religious leadership of the nation have opposed him from the beginning and have sought to kill him at every step. But here come these Greeks, these unwashed goyim, these Gentiles, seeking to meet him, to render him homage and honor. They don't even think to go directly to them, but they go to his associate and speak respectfully and carefully, asking if they can come see him. When Philip and Andrew bring this news to Jesus that the Greeks were seeking him out, I can't help but think that this was his realization, that the time has come, the hour has come, been rejected by the leaders of Israel, and here are the Gentiles at the gate, seeking to come in and to be a part of it. I wonder if he was reminded back to the recent events in John's Gospel in chapter 10, when he declared that he was the good shepherd, lays down his life for the sheep, speaking about Israel. He then goes on to state, verses 16 through 19 in John 10, Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore, my Father loves me, because I lay down my life, and I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down and to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. Therefore, there is a division again among the Jews because of these sayings. So we have here a beautiful image of the future church, the saving of the Gentiles. First representation of this other flock of sheep. They seek him out at the moment when his ultimate rejection by the leadership of Israel is imminent. He is ridden into the city, a donkey, just as the scriptures predicted, and they didn't rejoice, rather they lamented. Many of the people did cry out Hosanna, but the Pharisees, in fact, said, look, we aren't succeeding in stopping him at all. The whole world is following him. Of all people, they should have recognized their king. Israel has rejected him. Sheep from the other fold have sought him out. So the Greek said, we want to see Jesus. Do you want to see him? We have to realize seeing comes at a cost. That being our lives, as we will read later. The old song says, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. We now, with the benefit of the full New Testament, can see that following Jesus is a journey that ends at the cross. There is no other way to know the hope of the eternal life that he offers than to join those who have also given up their lives and to follow after the cross. The Greeks wanted to see him, to know him more, to experience him fully. But were they prepared for what came next? His answer, continuing in verse 23, we are told that this hour has come for the Son of Man to receive great glory. That's exactly what it says. Jesus answered them saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Another interesting word, glorified. In Greek it's pronounced doxadzo. It means to make glorious, to adorn with luster, to clothe with splendor. I might joke with you and say that I am uh, clothed in splendor this morning because I'm wearing this $1 uh, sports jacket that my wife got me at Goodwill. This is about as glorious and splendid as I dress up, okay? But the word here literally has that connotation, putting on glory, putting on splendor, to be adorned with luster. So what is this glory that he's referring to? Ultimately, his resurrection, his ascension into heaven, but what else at this moment? And I suggest to you, it's the cross. That, the cross, is what Jesus considered glory. Being on the cross is what he considered the Son of Man being glorified. We consider his passion, his time on the cross. He was naked, beaten, bloody, 
publicly mocked, tortured, unto death. All of those actions were consequences, the effect of the greater action, and that was of our sin being placed upon him at that moment and him carrying it. He who knew no sin becoming sin. And God's wrath at that moment and punishment for sin were unleashed upon him in full. Bearing sin and the scars of sin were to him, clothing him in splendor, based on this Greek definition. Now that's the heart of God. What to us would be the greatest shame is to him the greatest glory. How different we think of that now and how different we ourselves are. Webster's Modern Dictionary defines glory as praise, honor, distinction. No man in that day would look at the cross and consider the sight of the man on a cross praiseworthy or honorable any more than anyone today would look upon a prisoner on his way to the electric chair as praiseworthy, honorable, or distinctive. But there he was clothed in splendor and brought great glory. In verse 24, he explains why he must receive what he considers this great glory. Verse 24, he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. In the heart of Christ is shown here. His thought is not with the seed, but with the fruit borne by the seed. Not of the seed itself being alone and dead in the ground, as he himself would soon be alone and dead temporarily. But the purpose of that seed's death, the coming resurrection, the ascension in the church, is what matters. He is thinking of these Greeks that have come to him at this same time. They would be part of this great fruit that would be born. As a matter of fact, if you could turn to Romans chapter 11, um, verse 17, Paul describes this. Romans chapter 11, verse 17. Speaking about the Gentiles being grafted into the vine. And if some of the branches, in verse 17, and if some of the branches were broken off, and you, meaning the Gentiles, the Greeks, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. He goes on to say, do not boast against that branches, because at that time, uh, in the church, there was some division against Jewish believers and Gentile believers. But the image is still the same. Is anybody in here Jewish? There you go. Okay. We're all honored to be grafted into your vine this morning. Most of the rest of us are that wild olive tree. We had no part in that covenant, in that vine. We were completely separate, but it was God's work that grafted us together. And that's what he's thinking of here, I believe, when he refers to the church bearing fruit. First, he had to die to draw all people to him. And he goes on again in verse 25. He who loves his life will lose it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now the word he uses for life when he's mentioning loving your life or hating your life is the Greek word psyche, which we which is still a part of our language and our understanding, right? This word means the breath of life, your life force. Uh, it's that which takes a body and animates it. It's that which makes us alive physically. Uh, it's, it's the animal part of us that is alive and breathing. Our hearts are beating. That's what he's referring to there. It's the life of the individual, the life that is gone at death. However, at the end of verse 25, when he says... He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. The word he uses for life there in verse 25 is the Greek word zoa, which if you look at Blue Letter Bible, which is one of my favorite study uh, guides to consult, it says that that word means the absolute fullness of life, the abstract life, the life uh, beyond um, just your person and your body. It is a life essential and ethical, uh, real and genuine, devoted to God and blessed or 
happy. This is the life eternal that the scriptures speak of here. So there's two different uh, references to life. And he references loving and hating your life and life eternal. So in verse 26, he goes on to carry along this idea. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Jesus has many themes that he speaks to his followers about, but two that surface again and again to those who would follow him are sacrifice and service. And he reiterates these through his ministry and through the life that they should expect. So this is the life of the Christian from our Lord. Let the, let the dead bury the dead. Follow me. If you don't bury your cross and come after me, you can't be my disciple. Don't leave a hand on the plow and look back. If you do, you're not worthy of me. Sacrifice and come after me. The other aspect is service. And I think the, the single, succinct verse uh, that sums all that up is, let the greatest among you be the servant of all. Dr. Erwin Lutzer is a pastor at Moody Church in Chicago. And he once said, the easiest way to tell if you have the heart of a servant is to observe your heart's reaction when you are treated like one. Anybody ever been treated like a servant and thought perhaps, hmm, that wasn't nice, I didn't have that coming. More of that to come. There's a transition in verse 27 as we read after he shares the, the saying of um, loving life and losing it and speaking about his servant, some, suddenly he turns inwardly and he says, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. For this purpose, I came to this hour. Now, incidentally, the word soul that's translated in the New King James, which is what I'm using here, is the exact same word, psyche, in Greek. Again, referring to his uh, inward makings, his humanness, his humanity. That which makes him a living man is troubled. This life force, his breath, uh, is troubled. Uh, the meaning here, again, is that it's his human side, not his divine side, that is troubled, fearful uh, of what is coming. One translation says that he groaned in the spirit. His soul is troubled. He's afraid at the realization of what's coming. This language is very similar to uh, what Matthew records in uh, chapter 26, verses 38 through 39. This is in the Garden of Gethsemane, speaking to his disciples. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. We know that the author of John's Gospel, John, was present that evening in Gethsemane. So he twice saw the Lord in this moment of fear and sorrow. You may notice that in Gethsemane, when his death is more imminent, when he's closer to actually experiencing it, he actually says, let this cup pass before me, from me if possible. So the fear and the, and the angst that he's feeling about what he is to undergo is manifesting itself more further there. He's more troubled, if anything, there than he is in our scripture here in John. So we know that John was there and saw that as well. <coughs> fear is an interesting thing. Um, I was reading a story recently about a highly decorated soldier who was deployed to Afghanistan and Iraq. And this soldier and his men were part of a special operations unit. And their task was, day after day, night after night, they were literally kicking in doors and searching for terrorists, uh, leaders of terrorists, uh, people that they had reason to think were inside these homes. Well, their job was to go in and get them and take them out. Sometimes they would do this five or six times a night, house after house, kicking in a door, blowing a door off the hinges, having no idea if there's a man on the other side of the door with a gun waiting to shoot you. This man did this 118 times during one deployment and was never injured once. And I read an interview where they talked about all of 
they asked him about all of his military career, and they just described him as this incredibly brave, strong soldier. And they said, what is it like to have no fear? And he scoffed at them, and he said, fear is a primal human emotion. It's a sign of intelligence. It's a sign of understanding the situation that you're in. I don't want to go on missions with men who have no fear. I want to go on missions with men who are not overcome by their fear. So if you're not afraid in a drastic situation, then something's not right. Something between here and here isn't connected. It's like, and I don't want men like that. And it was this realization that this man that had done things that most of us would think are incredible, and only a fearless person could do them. The fear that he felt was the key in helping him to do what he needed to do. So there's nothing wrong with this fear that the man, Jesus, felt. The man, he was man and God, we know that, but his psyche, his person, his body was feeling that fear, and that trepidation. And that's perfectly natural and to be expected. It's useful. It's not to be avoided. It's not to be forgotten. It's to be overcome. Jesus felt it and overcame it. On verse 28, he reaffirms his mission. And he says, Father, glorify your name. Just as he does in Matthew 26, 39. Not as I will, but as you will. For this very reason, I was born. For this very reason, he came into the world for the cross. He felt the fear and overcame it. And we as Christians aren't protected from pain. We have no insurance policy against agony. It all depends on how we deal with that pain and that fear and our motive. Jesus, of all people, deserved to be saved from the hour of his trial. But he wasn't saved from it. He was saved for it. And so are we in our Christian walk. In the Old Testament, the book of Esther could be titled, For a Time Such as This, it comes from a scene where Esther's life is at stake. She must plead for the life of her people before her husband, the king. For anyone, including her, to enter his presence unannounced could mean instant death. Thinking of this, she was wavering in fear, but then Uncle Mordecai reminded her in Esther chapter 4, verse 14, if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance from the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to a royal position for just such a time as this. Who knows but that whatever crisis we are facing, whatever turmoil or struggle has come into our lives, that we were prepared by God and created for it for this very hour. For the expression, cometh the hour, cometh the man. Rest assured, God will bring about the hour. And if we relinquish control of our lives to him, if we will say, Lord, not as I will, but as you will, he will bring forth the man for the hour as well. Now it's significant as well that he says, Father, glorify your name. There's special emphasis on your, or in the King James, if you if you're the King James, thy name. Just the very trinity is others-centered, as we are called to be. When Jesus said, love your neighbor, most of you probably already know this, the word he used there for love is agape, and that means desire the greatest good for your neighbor over yourself. Most of the time when Jesus is telling us to love others, that's the meaning. Desire more good for them than for yourself. And here he demonstrates that God in the Trinity itself is other-centered. He is God, but he defers to the Father. At the same time, the Father tells others in Scripture, Hear my Son, I am pleased with him. Later on, Jesus tells his followers that the Holy Spirit will come, and that through him they will do even greater deeds than he. But the Spirit comes to glorify the Son. Other-centered love and submission is at the heart of the Trinity. Even in the midst of great pain, fear, the one person who could claim to deal with God the Father on a level playing field 
He doesn't plead for himself. He says, Father, your will be done. Your name be glorified. Whatever comes at this hour, your will be done. Your name be glorified. Notice he receives an answer in verse 28 through 29. A second part of verse 28, I should say. A voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Meaning, God the Father is speaking and saying, I have glorified my name up to this point and I will continue to glorify it forever. Notice what it says in verse 29. The people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others, however, said, an angel has spoken to him. Notice everybody heard something. Some people were able to tell that it was a divine act, that the Lord was speaking to him. And some people just said it was thunder. Some people were prepared uh, to see the Lord working in that moment, and some were not. God's work is unmistakable. His working is in this world, his creation, no one can deny. Some of us are willing to understand, to see and to hear, and some of us are not. In verse 30, Jesus speaking to the people, he says, This voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. You'll notice that whether in uh, John's Gospel or in the Garden of Gethsemane, there's really no doubting. There's really no um, questioning um, by the Son to the Father. In fact, the way it's worded here, uh, when he says in verse 27, he says, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this reason I have come to this hour. So he knows what he has to do. He doesn't need the reassurance. The reassurance is for those who are there listening to him. So in verse 31, he goes on. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. So what does it mean that the world was judged? How is the world judged? By the cross. Consider this. Jesus came into this world not as a God, but as God and man. He lived among us. He was born as lowly as a man could be born into this world. And he dwelt with us. In that time, he committed no sins, no wrongs, lived a perfect life. Perfectly just, perfectly righteous. What was the world's response to this life that he lived, to his teachings, to his actions. Crucify him. Now we know he came to die, and he knew he came to die. He tells us he has the power to lay down his life of his own accord, and that he was doing it because he wanted to. Yet he was totally innocent. Nothing that he did in this world was deserving of what he received. So the world and the systems of the world, and I would suggest to you there are two systems of the world at that time. One was religious, Pharisees and the priests, and the other was secular, and that was Rome. Held him in nothing but contempt. And for all of his perfect righteousness, for his teachings, for his calls for love, forgiveness, all they could offer in return is death. In the face of divine perfection, the highest levels of power in this world decreed execution, guilt. Yet, he was totally innocent. Do you know, his trial, the entire proceedings of the trial were completely irregular for what a Jewish trial was supposed to be. People tried at that time could only be convicted based on the agreement of witnesses. The Pharisees brought forth witnesses, but the Bible says they didn't agree. Their stories matched. They weren't. It was, it was falling apart in court. An astute court reporter at that time, after hearing the witnesses, Jesus' trial would have said, well, they got nothing on this guy. In fact, it's only in um, desperation that Jesus is questioned directly because Someone on trial, their testimony meant nothing. Again, it was about what the witnesses had to say. And finally, they ask him, is he the son of man? Has he done all of these things? And he says, very gently and respectfully, ask the people who heard me. They were all there. 
and they beat him in response. He was actually playing by the rules. He was following the law to the fullest, as he would as, as a, as a uh, faithful and observant Jew. The law says, bring witnesses who can convict me. So ask them what I said. If I've done it wrong, bring it forth. The trial was a sham. He was killed. He was desired, to, it was desired that he should be killed out of greed, jealousy, and hatefulness. But everything he did was perfect. Sinless and without fault. Because of that, he rose from the grave, proving that he was what he said he was, and that he had overcome death. See, in this world, in the world of man, the world of the Pharisees, the world of the Romans, death was the ultimate reality. It was the ultimate ruling power. When he rose from the grave, because death could not hold him, he overcame and judged this world and showed its ways are not equal. Now there's a new way, since he is risen. As he says in John chapter 16, verse 33, Take heart, I have overcome the world. Now in verse 32, he describes to them how it is that he is going to die. He says, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. Now again, the Greek word here for lifted up, hypsos, has two meanings. And one means literally to be physically elevated. Uh, if I were, if you guys uh, decided you heard enough and you wanted to put a hook right here and lift me up and hoist me out and over that way towards the door and just kind of leave me hanging there, you'd have to hypsos me up to put me in that place. So it literally means to be picked up, to be elevated, to be lifted. The listener at that time would have understood instantly that being lifted up from the earth meant to be placed on the cross. John explains to the reader in verse 33 very clearly, says he was referring to the manner of his death. Now, hypsis also means to lift up on high, to praise, like we were doing this morning, and Randy was leading us. He used the same word, and they were both true at the same time, but people could not square those things away. Recall that Jesus said the hour had come for him to receive great glory. It is unlikely that even his disciples at that time understood what he meant by that. We can't reconcile the glory of death, can't reconcile our idea of glory with death on the cross. It's the heart of God, mind of God, and not of man. Neither could the multitude who were listening there, as is shown in verse 34, when they answered and said, the people answered him saying, we have heard from the law that Christ remains forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Now, recognize this was a ridiculous question. He had told them many times in John's Gospel previously that he was the Son of Man. In addition, another thing was going on at this time. The people were ignorant of many of the scriptures about the Messiah, with the full knowledge of God. Here's what had happened. They lived under tyranny by the Romans for so long, denied the liberty that they were used to, they became obsessed with politics, with this political structure that they were living on, and a desire for freedom, naturally, as would we all. Their religious leaders, the people they looked to, mixed politics and scripture, and over time their belief system became political. They sought relief from earthly oppression from Rome. Eventually they came to think of their Messiah only in terms of politics. So the only thing that the people were taught were the scriptures of the heroic Messiah that would destroy the enemies of Israel, that would rescue the people and restore Zion. They neglected the full picture. Listen, if you will, to some of the Old Testament scripture prophecies of the Messiah, just a few. 
to make the point about everything that he was. Twenty-second <coughs> Psalm, verse seven. All who see me mock me; they wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him. Again, we think of Jesus on the cross. The priest saying, let him come down off the cross, then we'll believe that he's the Messiah. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14, speaking of the Messiah, he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to its inhabitants. Isaiah, again, chapter 49, verse 6. God speaking to the Messiah, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations, all nations, that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. Psalm 118, verse 22, the stone that the builders have rejected has become the corner stone, the most important stone, the stone that holds the whole structure up. Finally, most famously, Isaiah chapter 53, uh, describing the suffering servant. I'm going to read portions of that that were written hundreds of years before Jesus. And ask yourself, how could someone charged with knowing the law, knowing God's word, know this scripture and not recognize the Lord? Isaiah chapter 53. He is despised, rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. But surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. To bruise him. He has put him to grief. Because he poured out his soul unto death, he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. I didn't read everything, not just in the interest of time. But again, if you're charged with the spiritual well-being of Israel, and you're a teacher of God's word, how do you not see Christ? How do you not see in Jesus the man who was walking in that time and teaching? How do you not see him as the king that he was? How do you not see your king coming? See, they let their political desires inform their spiritual walk rather than allowing their spiritual walk to inform their politics. Ultimately, the things of this world will come to nothing and will end in darkness if we trust in them more than we do Again, when they ask, who is the Son of Man, as we mentioned, he had already told them many times that he was the Son of Man. He mentioned it in John chapter 5. So they refused to accept him, knew who he was, and hated him because he was not what they thought the Messiah should be based on their incomplete understanding of Scripture. Or perhaps their eyes had been blinded, like those in the last days. They are so caught up in other affairs that the works of the Spirit are dulled and blunt. I'm not going to tell anybody here not to be political, not to have political interests. I do. I think we all do. I think we're all... Was anybody aware that there was an election just recently? Anybody hear about that? Okay. It, it kind of made news here and there. And I got caught on in it just like anybody else. Now, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, who I voted for, or who you should have voted for, or anything like that. I am going to tell you and when I looked at the people running, I said, if there was ever a time 
when we need to realize our hope rests in the Lord and not with man, it is today. Don't let the things of this world interfere with our walk. After all, we have the chance now to walk in light. Place your trust in things that are going to go by the wayside. Politics, sports, power, money, our jobs, our homes, these things will all come to nothing in the end. As we uh, move toward wrapping this up, verses 35 and 36, when they ask him, who is this son of man? Jesus answers them, verse 35. A little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. But while you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. So walk in the light while you have it. He wasn't going to be there for much longer. At that moment, the Lord himself was standing in front of them. He had taught them and spoken, and he was right there with them. And he extols them. Walk in the light while you have the chance. Eventually, Darkness will overtake you. And when you're walking in darkness, you don't know where you are going. Sometimes our walk is like that. Our family recently went through a very difficult time. Some of you know about it, some of you don't. Suffice it to say, it was trying, and it lasted so much longer than it should have. And there were days when there was just a heaviness over us, and, but we decided at this time we are going to seek the Lord every day. And we are going to do everything we know to do to make this situation right. And this went on for months. And the funny thing was, it only seemed to get worse in terms of a conflict we were having with another person. It just, that person seemed to be more and more resistant to us as we tried to be more and more uh, forgiving, more and more of uh, a desire for resolution. And I commented to Julie, I said, I've never tried so hard for so long to do the righteous thing and received so much uh, um, not interference, resistance in the process. I've never had so much trouble for trying to do so good. And I thought about that for a minute. I was like, yeah, it's, it's pretty much what he promised us. Right? And then I said, well, think if I were this faithful about all the issues in my life I need to address. There would be so much resistance, my entire strength would fail. I'd have to rely solely on the Lord. What would I look like then? And I thought about that for a second. I was like, wow. And I felt really convicted for a long time. But during that time, what I really came to feel more than anything else is that our walk in the light here on earth is limited. We don't know when it will end. One day, I feel sure, we all look back with regrets. Had we done this or that differently? Having children and seeing children grow up suddenly makes you realize you're, you're one step closer to the grave every day. And in fact, you're, probably, you're really just working your way there so that the next generation can step over you and continue walking and do better. And that gives you, that gives you a good perspective. There's so little time for these things, ultimately, guys. There's so little time for us to be divided over politics or disagreements or family affairs. There's so little time. We will all look back and regret while we were here, while we were in the light, while we had the chance, we let these things simmer, go untreated, go unresolved. We don't have time to waste on the things of this world. Our time should be fully devoted to the Lord. And the things of this world will take care of themselves.
So there were three things we wanted to discuss. Seeing Jesus, the coming of the hour, and walking in the light. I would say that we need to continue to seek him and desire to see him as those Greeks did that day. And understand that seeing him, hearing him, experiencing him means taking up our own cross and following after him. We know that the coming of the hour for him was difficult to overcome, but he overcame it. We know those hours will come for us as well. But we, by the same strength, by the same power, can overcome it. And while we are here, while we are together, in fellowship, as brothers and sisters, let's walk in the light as he is in the light. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we do just thank you for this time, Lord, for your word. Lord, I pray that all of us here today, having heard your word, Lord, we would love you more, we would seek to follow you more, Lord, we would recognize how precious is our time that you have given us. How thankful we are to know that Jesus is our Savior. That whatever our approaches in our life that we have to overcome, He has already overcome this world and everything in it. Lord, whatever forces press down upon us, we have a kingdom to look forward to. Lord, I just pray that you would bless us with a spirit of peace, a spirit of understanding. Lord, that our walk would be in the light. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. I ask you to go before us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Won't you stand for our last song?